Good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. It is a wonderful time to be here this afternoon with so many community members and soon to be alumni and all of these Carthage families. Uh, as a, just a point, I was just across the street at the first pinning ceremony of the first cohort of nurses uh, graduated from Carthage and have never been to one of these before. Unbelievably touching experience. I mean, you can just see the pride in these families and these kids so excited about finally reaching their dream of becoming a nurse. It just happened and it's another one of those marvelous things that Carthage does so often every day and never really gets reported, people wear, but it's, it's, there's magic being created on campus seems like all the time here. So, uh, though the room, uh, though many in the room uh, already know our president, John Swallow, it, it is my pleasure to take a moment to introduce him and uh, to introduce our very special guest, President uh, Dom Bictwee. John is completing his second year at Carthage, having arrived in 2017 from his alma mater, the University of the South, where he served first as provost and then as executive vice president and provost a longtime mathematics and humanities professor at Davidson College. John has lived in the world of liberal arts and he truly appreciates its values. Here at Carthage, John has been dedicated to ensuring that students make the best use of the Liberal Arts Foundation to develop life skills and to discover their vocations. With John as our very special guest, Dom Bictwee, who is the founding president of Fulbright University Vietnam, the first nonprofit private institution in Vietnam to embrace the American concept of liberal arts education. As a daughter of two teachers, President Twee appreciated the value of education long before stepping into a leadership role. Her earliest memories of school include studying by lamplight in the Vietnamese countryside. From these humble beginnings, President Thuy launched a successful career in international finance. Now she is changing course, asking critical questions about what education should mean for society as she launches this new institution of higher learning. Please join me in welcoming President John Swallow and President Don Bic Thuy, our guests and speakers this afternoon. We're delighted that you're here, President Twee, and I will have to say to begin that I've just been fascinated by this project. Uh, sometimes I think about an alternate universe in which uh, we can start from scratch. We can think about an institution like this and its values and its education and start from some first principles. And so with that sort of fascination, uh, when we met at uh, New President's Camp, uh, this was at Harvard at 2017. Uh, I thought, surely there will be lots and lots to learn from your experience. So le let me start with a question. Um, for this audience, uh, this has been an institution that's been years in the making. In fact, it's taken longer than I had even anticipated. So perhaps you could share with us how long it's taken, what were some steps along the way, and where you are right at this moment. Okay, so first of all, thank you so much for having me here. Uh, it is the, my pleasure and the, the honor to share this very important moment with the, all of you. So uh, I began um, the journey to build the university in 2009. I remember that I was sitting in my little office uh, in Hanoi, which was also very beautiful, looking over the lake. But then it is not the same lake that President Swallow <laughs> have, much smaller. And uh, two of my friends who were from Harvard, and they were in my office, and we started talking about the idea of having an undergrad, a four years undergrad uh, university in Vietnam. At that time, even though I was engaged, um, in the conversation, but I thought that it was just a, a little nice dream because I never believed that uh, our government would allow something like a liberal education in a country which is not known to be liberal. Uh, we talk about it and we bounce ideas and then I just kept it as a dream. I continue with my career in finance chasing money, not ideas. <laughs> but then, th 
things keep going and I think inching forward. And I remember in 2014, which was five years later, uh, I was invited by the government to, to meet with them and started talking about the principles of a university. We had a very clear bottom line for the university. We would not do it if the university was not independent, not, not for profit, and not private. And all we asked from the government was, we, we didn't want money from the government. We need land because land belongs to the state. There was, not, um, there was no alternative to go about it. And what we need is a good governance because we believe that with a good governance, that's how university get to excellence. Um, what we meant by good governance was um, independence and autonomy and academic freedom. As you could imagine, talking about academic freedom in a country like Vietnam at that time was very, very daring because uh, it meant that it is freedom of speech, freedom of expression, freedom of asking or inquiry. So all this um, took us about f nearly f five years to discuss with the government. And in 2014, that's when they decided that, okay, let's talk about what you wanted. And it took us another two years to nail down everything. And we said that, okay, we need you to sign that piece of paper because <laughs> I didn't want to run a university to find out one day I could be in jail by promoting freedom of inquiry and freedom of expression. And the day came. Um, now, it was not only thanks to our persistence, um, but I think that um, to the chance and then circumstances were also right at the time that the government decided to give us the approval. That was at the moment when the relationship between the US and, and, and Vietnam became really, really good. And in 2016, May 2016, exactly three years ago, President Obama came to Vietnam and launched our university officially. So from that day, I had the, I think the, um, the opportunity to go out and recruit faculty, recruit some of the students, started thinking about the curriculum, and began um, the, the work. So last year, also in May, we admitted the first group of students, 54 students, to come in, not to begin an academic year, but to begin what we call a co-design year with our founding faculty. Why we did that? We decided that, okay, we were such a latecomer in the universe of universities, and let's not waste such opportunity by trying to replicate something that has been in existence for 100 years which has been great, but then probably um, there are many other things that we can try to imagine about university for the next 10, 20, or 50 years to come. So that's why we decided to spend one full year for faculty and real students to co-design what we call an experience for education in Vietnam. And, and that co-design year came to an end by the end of this month. And our 54 co-designers are going to be joined by another 70 students to form the inaugural class of 125 students. And they will start in um, uh, September. So we have been only one year old compared to what you are running, President Swallow. Um, and I'm so humble being here and seeing, I think, how well-established universities have achieved. And um, 
what you could do. But at the same time, I think that we also find out in the last one year, working between faculty and students, about things that we can change to be relevant for the 21st century. And um, that's where we are at the moment. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Well, as you can see, there'll be many questions that we'll want to yeah. follow up with. Uh, but uh, before we get into the curriculum and the faculty yeah. about which I know we will have much interest, uh, so this has been a project that has involved uh, the support of the American government across uh, two different administrations and has not been controversial. And in fact, I think as I heard you say yesterday, there were uh, 10 American senators who came to visit. So if you could speak about the American investment in the project. Um, I think that it was not only the two administrations. I, it began with the President Clinton in 1995. Hmm. And that was a time when the embargo was lifted and then the US government decided how to engage with Vietnam after the war at that time. And I think our two biggest supporters, we call the two Johns, John Kerry and John McCain, have been, I think, strongly supported of the idea of education exchange because they believe that probably education is the best way to heal the past. And so we, from 1995 until now, I think we've gone through, I think, several administrations, both Democrats and Republicans, and Fulbright have always been a bipartisan um, initiative, and we so far haven't faced with any of the so-called ups and downs of um, American politics, which is for me, I, I don't want to get there. <laughs> you know, I try to stay away. Um, so, uh, about a month ago, no, three weeks ago, we had a chance, it is during um, Easter Sunday, I remember it so vividly, 10 U.S. Senators came to our campus, and they were, and both Democrats and Republicans, 10% of your Senate, which is significant, <laughs> they, they were on our campus, and they wanted to hold the town hall with our students. They were very curious about, I think, how the students actually reacted, how they, what they thought about the education that we are trying to promote for them. And I have to say that um, the town hall was, I think, it exceeded my expectation um, and anything that I can imagine. As you could imagine, the senators, before they came to our campus, they were skeptical. Now, I'm not sure whether it is the right project, why, and then can they get there, and then with all the constraint of the political system. So they, they wanted to, they, they gave us a timeline of about 50 to 60 minutes for the whole town hall, from the day that they landed on our campus and then until they left. They end up stay for more than two hours. And Yes, and they, they came back, and this week, or last week, I had a chance to, um, to spend the whole day on the hill, meeting with them again and see what can we do more. And I think I now have 10 very strong supporters in Congress, believing in what we are doing. And of course, that's, um, the, the credit go to, also to a long supporter of the project, not only the people today. Well, thank you. Yeah. So, imagining starting a university from scratch in Vietnam uh, with American support and thinking about the long history of educational tradition in the U.S., uh, which we think of as the liberal arts, which goes back to uh, the medieval period and be before that into the Greek period. Uh, one thing that we are challenged with here uh, as Americans is even talking about what that means anymore. Uh, what are the liberal arts? Uh, what does that mean to people? How foundational is it to education? It's been absolutely foundational to this institution, as many other residential colleges. Uh, but when you come at this anew, uh, how do you explain the liberal arts and what it means to Fulbright University U Vietnam? No, this is a fascinating topic, and I don't think that we have ever stopped trying to find a different way of explaining what liberal arts means. Because I, I know that even in the US, there has been a lot of discussion and debate about the value of liberal arts and then what it means by saying you are 
conducting or you are carrying out a liberal arts education. In Vietnam, I think that I have um, both the advantage and the disadvantage of launching this. The advantage is not many people understand what liberal arts mean. And um, I think parents love to send their kids to Europe and the US. And they thought that they got a wonderful education, but they didn't know that a lot of their children are adopting the liberal arts education. But anything American education is considered, I think that it is top quality. Mm -hmm. So if I can say that it is American style education, yeah, everybody just love it. And so my job is easy on that front. But the disadvantage that, that we found is that to answer the question of what job my children are going to get, which is, I think, that it is also a part of the discussion in the US yes. about the career after the, the college. And for us, trying to explain the whole values of not going into the skill base but then giving you the kind of um, the ability to question, the ability to present your ideas, the ability to articulate what you, you, you mean, and I think the ability to live, I think, or to, to build a lifelong learning cap capability, it is much harder. And until today, I think that I whenever I, I went to any of the outreach event and talking to parents, no matter what, I think we talk about values, we talk about skills, we talk about, um, uh, I think, the knowledge, but at the end of the day, parents always ask, okay, what kind of job that my, my kids are going to get? Um, one thing which is so, so far, by the end of the first year with uh, our student, our co-design student, we have been able to answer some of these questions um, to the, the parents. Even though the 54 students, they did something the core design year, it is not fully academic year yet. We call it year zero. And more than 50% of these students already got offer for internship at the very top companies in Vietnam. Why they got that? It was not because of the knowledge. Uh, because they haven't started a full academic year. But then the ability to run a project, manage a project, present idea, debate, um, I think asking questions, these are things that actually it was, I think, uh, in huge demand in Asia and in Vietnam, where the tradition of education is more about road learning, right, memorization, and suddenly you have a group of students who are confident in articulating their ideas, in asking questions. It becomes like, a, I think, a great asset and in huge demand. And we started answering these questions to the parents in a more like a fact-based way rather than the president just making promise. Yeah, that's what we have been doing. Uh, in some ways, it's an education where yeah, you know it when you see it at the end, yes. uh, but it's hard to describe at the beginning. And so we use phrases here like critical thinking and problem solving, communication, yes. presentation, analysis. Uh, and it is an ongoing question about how to describe and then how to implement an education like this. And so for us, uh, who've been around for 150, 170 some years, uh, it's been an evolution, as you know. Um, there have been, we're now on our fourth campus, uh, and I don't know how many faculty generations we could even count, uh, and the curriculum has evolved. Uh, I'm reminded that our original concert band started uh, playing in 1870, apparently wow. on the rooftop of one of our buildings, because there weren't uh, yeah. a lot of facilities. Uh, and so, so let's, let's get to the, the really fun part here. Yes. So if you can start a curriculum from scratch, and even before that, hire a faculty from scratch, from the beginning. Yes. Uh, nothing is pre-existing, no processes, no organizational yeah. structures, yes. no culture, <laughs> but you could just start afresh. Yes. How do you do it? So, so we, we, we did a lot of unusual things. Um, now, uh, I'm new to the academic world, and 
I found that academia is fascinating. And the way how people think, how people uh, do things, are so different from the rest <laughs> of the world. <laughs> so, so having the core design here is already something very different for many academics. Because the idea of you can just import a curriculum or a course to Fulbright and to Vietnam and teaching the Vietnamese students and think that we work. Um, so we, we challenge that assumption. We also challenge some assumption about the capability of the students that we recruit and we have in our class and their work ethic and their desire to obtain such kind of education because there is nothing like that in the country. In the US, if they don't go to one college or to follow one program, they have a thousand other options. So people basically have the, they, they enjoy the luxury of choice. In Vietnam, we will be the first who offer true that type of education, whether you call it liberal art or whatever we are trying to define. So even for faculties, the way we recruit our founding faculty is also very different from the traditional way. Let me explain what we are doing. So usual CV, you do the screen, the first cut. Then we have the, the interview, Zoom call or Skype. But then for the finalists, we brought them all to Vietnam and we asked them to do three things for us. One is to give a class to the real students in Vietnam and see how and the students, we have a chance to evaluate the professors. And some students call like, okay, it is like, um, I think having a, a, a parents even be like, um, what, what you call, basically, even before you were born, you can decide which parents that you, <laughs> you, you can have. If only, right? Yeah. So they, they teach a class. That's for students. We want them to work in group, faculty too, or candidates. They run a group project. And we want to see how they work mm -hmm. together. Because if we co-design the whole experience, it means that people have to work together. They just can't be in their little silo of their department anymore. And the third one is to do a um, topic talk, I think, in uh, something of their discipline. And then we talk to their peers and then all the people in the, in the field. So they did three of that. Mm -hmm. And so we have students doing the evaluation, of course. They are not uh, making a final decision. But the the professor also can see the kind of students that they will have to interact with in the future. And that's how we, we did it with our founding faculty. Of course, we cannot do it forever because it is hugely time consuming and expensive. But we believe that in order to build the, the DNA of that kind of culture in learning and, and teaching, it is worth doing it for the first two or three years for our faculty. Now curriculum. Um, we, we, we did a lot of interesting things uh, with the curriculum. Uh, deciding what would be called and what would be required for the first year and what would be elective and how we are going to do it. Um, it takes a lot of time and the debates among academics is fascinating. You never get to it. <laughs> to any decision, and sometimes I think the president have to exercise the so-called executive power to <laughs> say, okay, we are going to go with this. Um, so we, we made a few intentional decisions from day one. Um, it is going to be interdisciplinary teaching, and so we pulled out the whole department's war. So and no it, departments? No, no departments. So people... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I know that you will say, oh, <laughs> um, so no departments, uh, a lot of co-teaching 
and especially for the core requirements. Um, but so the courses were designed to be inter truly interdisciplinary. So for example, I just give you an, um, so we have engineering 101, right? And we do a course called engineering for humanities. So that is engineering combined with psychology and with sociology. Students were asked to go to the nursing home and talk to elders, people who struggle with how their daily life is, um, and then they, they need help. So they have to interview all these elders and decide that what are the, the helps or the products that these people need. They returned to campus, they worked together, they came up with some ideas, presented back to the elders, and then agree on something that they are going to produce. So they will prototype, they will try it, and then they come up with the final products. The key thing for us is not about the skill, but then teaching these 17 and 18 years old the ability to talk to people who are so different from you with a huge age gap and then still on the same wavelength in terms of empathy, in terms of understanding, so that they can share what they need with you. It is a fascinating course. I thought that the student would hate it, but when I saw the, the, the moment that they presented the final products to the lady or the gentleman that um, they chose to do the products to, and all hug each other and cry. I think that that's why engineering have reached the level that we expected. It is not purely a product, but it has to be something that rather than pushing the products, we want it to be something that the user truly needs. And I think that if you can teach or if you can touch the emotion of the user and I think that that's why we want engineering to get to. Another course that we did, that we flipped completely um, the curriculum that faculty built from, the, from day one is rhetoric. All our, our professors, they prepare the curriculum for rhetoric and they present it to the students. But then they did ask the questions that, can you look at it and see whether rhetoric could be taught in that way in Vietnam, in Asian culture? Mm -hmm. Students went away and they rip up completely the curriculum and they said that the, the way how we, how we argue, how we convince people in Asia is very different from the Western world. It just couldn't be like that and we need to show the balance of how Western rhetoric is like and how Eastern and China influence rhetorics are like. And they build it all over again, that curriculum. And it has become, I think, that a very proud moment for both our faculty and the students. And that's what we have been doing in the last one year. But I know that we are not going to stop for one year during the core design years. All we are trying to do is to create a DNA in the institution that things need to evolve and change continuously because I know that the 21st century and then many, in many years to come, we just can't stand still anymore with knowledge. And um, I think I have a chance to start from scratch and hopefully that I can build, or we, we can build that DNA in a higher, um, at or higher education institution that many other people in the world say, you cannot do it with academia. <laughs> and we are trying. And then please wish us success. <laughs> I, I don't know, but then at least we try. <laughs> oh, this is so fascinating. And there's so many ways for us to go. Uh, I'm thinking about the um, interaction that your students, that, the, first of all, you started with students and yeah. then uh, as you have these students, you have them interact with people from diverse backgrounds. Yeah. To, and in, in 
Sometimes we here talk about pure versus applied, but this is a very applied situation, talking to people about what they actually need, uh, and then working with that together. Um, and then to take a discipline like rhetoric, one of the oldest ones that you might say, oh, that's, a, that's one of those things that go back in our sense to the Greeks. This yeah. is one of those where there's so many people to read. And yet, as your students reported to you, it's probably one of the most applied fields there is because you cannot have rhetoric unless you have people today to interact with. And so I'm thinking about all of this and thinking about how we could uh, establish this culture that you're describing of thinking about uh, what students might need today, uh, how we can bring uh, all the knowledge and experience and expertise of faculty members together. So this leads me uh, to think about where, uh, where you think a good organizational structure would be. So now that you have all of these, no doubt, creative people, the students who've started, the faculty who are starting, um, before things settle too much, yep. uh, will you have committees? task forces? Oh, uh, will you have a few people who, who are able to lead by themselves and, and watch it happen? Um, is it organic? Is it structured from the top? What, what's your vision for this? Um, I, I know that the, I, I can, cannot always do uh, like a decision from the top because I'm running a university and faculty would never want decision from the top, right? <laughs> Um, so, uh, I think that we, we started with, um, I think, a small task force and then discussing about shared governance, which is, I think, that it seems to, it fascinated me. Um, and, but then we promised uh, among ourselves that before we put it as, I think, a firm policies or anything, we allow the policies or all the all the ideas and then the structures to be run for a year or two um, before we say, okay, you have signed off that policy, so please follow that process and don't even try to, um, to divert from that. So we agree that principle. I know that at some point we will have to settle with a certain policies and structure so that the, the uh, organization can reach some like a stability but the idea is still like that things change so much. And then if we started from the basic principle that the student is going to be at the center of everything that we are going to do, then we have to accept the fact that sometimes things have to change um, in order to live truly to that principle. Um, we have committees, yes, we have, um, we have one thing that uh, I share with you and your chairman yesterday is that I have even two boards, not only one. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I have to, we have to manage all that. Um, but then at least people seem to understand that we are like a startup. Mm -hmm. And startup requires a very different way of being run and being built. And uh, I think until now, I think that I got a lot of support from our two boards to maintain such flexibility and dynamics of a startup organization. Well, I want to make sure we have a chance for members of the audience also to ask questions. Yeah. But before we do that, there's one more question I'd like yeah. to ask uh, while I have the privilege of the floor. And I know there's been a wave of uh, liberal arts colleges or startups, if you want to think of them that way, in Asia. And so how does this institution compare with some of those that have that have been tried or experimented with in, in other countries and in other structures. How do you think of yourself in that constellation? No, one thing that we, we, we look at all the other trial and errors in the world with the liberal arts, and we made, I think, a very intentional decision of the way how we, we incorporate ourselves. One is that definitely we didn't want to be um, overseas branch campus uh, of a university in the US, right? Mm -hmm. We thought hard about partnership from day one. And we, we went down the, the road of talking to a few institutions, but then we realized that when you are still very young, mm -hmm. and if you partner with someone, the chance that 
the, the partner want to dominate and then to control what you are doing and try to guide you to a, down a certain path is would, would be, I think, pretty obvious. So we, we drop the idea of partnership um, at that point in time. And that's why we decided to be, I think, independent and um, not-for-profit, private, and build it from there, from the ground up, from scratch. Because we have a chance to define what we mean by university. And our, our vision is to, we, we, we call it more like a tagline in business, we reimagine the university. And we know that we want to innovate, but not replicate. And we can only do it if we are by our, ourselves. But at the same time, in order to do that, you, you have to work much harder because you don't, you, you don't have, I think, a big brothers or big sisters to fall back on. But now I realize that actually it works really well because so many people want to, to help us. And because they also want some of their ideas that they couldn't implement in their, in their institutions to be tried and adopted in our institution. And so far it works well. Yeah. Great. So I know there are questions from the audience. There are a number of uh, faculty members, uh, students, uh, academic administrators, uh, board members, uh, all of whom have a, a part to play in all of this. And so please, uh, questions from the audience. Uh, thank you, uh, very articulate, and I wish you great luck in your uh, project. I need a lot of luck, um, yes. <laughs> never hurts to have luck. Yeah. Um, how, uh, what sort of uh, majors, and will it be like a four-year degree, and uh, is your faculty and student population uh, predominantly Vietnamese, or will you have other um, cultures come in to be on your faculty and in your student body? Yeah, so let me answer the second part of your questions first. Our faculty came from all over the world, and because when we advertise and we recruit, um, Basically, we, we did it internationally and follow, I think, a, a very uh, stringent process. Um, so we have people from uh, India, from China, they, but then all of them have been working or teaching in the U.S. Mm. And the majority of our, um, our faculty was still like um, non-Vietnamese. All the Vietnamese faculty, they were also have been teaching in the U.S. A lot of people we ask, so why? Why couldn't you get the Vietnamese um, professors in Vietnam? I think liberal arts teaching is very, very special. And if you haven't gone through it, it is very difficult to explain to a professor what we meant by liberal arts education. And even we, today, we still can't articulate exactly what we meant, right? So our faculties have come from over the world, but they all have a very strong experience of teaching in the U.S. Uh, before. In terms of major, um, the way how we um, think about it is that we have three, we have um, humanities and social science, then math and, um, and science, and then um, compute, uh, computing and engineering. So I think the, the, the degree we show that you are be a Bachelor of Art or Bachelor of Science and then all, but then they have a concentration on their, um, uh, on their degree. Out of the, the fourth year of the students, uh, it will all be for capstone project. So they, w they will need to finish all their theory um, in the first three years. And year four is for capstone, whether it is thesis or a project or an, uh, an intern or, or whatever. And like I shared with uh, President Swallow yesterday, is that the way how we decide the transcript is that they have grades. But at the same time, there will be a portfolio of projects that they have gone through or uh, completed or done during the 
four years at the school. When we design, in, in the first year, when we co-design the whole thing with students and, uh, and faculty, we also brought in the industry, the employers, on the t to the table with us and say, exactly what do you need? And, and they told us what they, they need. And we reflected in the way how we design major. So the student is not going to be math major, physics major, or uh, literature, but they will be in that discipline and with a concentration that describe what they focus in uh, in their studies. Yes. Uh, so I really applaud the uh, the notion of um, uh, doing uh, mostly interdisciplinary courses. Yeah. I think in the in the real world there are no problems that are not interdisciplinary. Uh, nothing gets solved without without an interdisciplinary effort. So and then and then having students work in teams is just a uh, reflection of the real world as well. So. Um, are you able to are you able to construct all of your courses that way, or are there some like a statistics class or or something like that that where you have to run it in a more conventional kind of way? Yeah, I agree with you. It is not for everything, um, and especially when you, for example, in um, computer science, and if some students just want to go down the engineering route, right? Uh, it is better that you do it. I think. Traditional, but then traditional doesn't mean that you everything would be in uh, in the classroom. The, the professor lecture, um, and then they take note. Uh, so we can still be innovative in a way of how you use uh, online course, how you basically connect, because now internet is so strong and powerful that they can actually join some class not outside of Vietnam and then in the US and with professor teaching from the US or they can just go to an I think a three weeks or or I think a month intern with one company so even though we we do it like a, in a traditional way but then we always try to find out I think a new way how students learn today to make sure that they get the depth but at the same time, they must be agile enough to, I think, to adopt to a new environment. But I agree with you. Yeah, it just can't be like adopting across the board that interdisciplinary, because then it, it be, some topic will become superficial and not not um, deep enough. Yeah. Yes. President Chui, um, I've been uh, fascinated by um, observing President Swallow's interactions with his two um, children who are college aged and their advice to him as a president. And I know your daughter just graduated from college. Yes. Um, tell me, tell us about what your relationship is like with her and does she give you advice as a new president? What <laughs> kinds of things does she tell you? Um. Oh gosh! Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, I, actually, my my daughter graduated uh, how many days ago? Three days ago, right? Yeah, uh, on the twenty second. Yeah. Um, she. Um, what can I say? Actually, um, so my daughter went to the same school with um, President Swallow to Yale, and when she was at Yale, and she also work on, I think, a big um, paper for, for the Kennedy School about trying to build an apex institution, a liberal arts institution in Asia. Mm -hmm. And so she... <laughs> <laughs> she has a lot to tell you. She gave me a lot of advice, unfortunate, but then it is good for me that um, she just couldn't get near to Fulbright I think that we agree about the conflict of interest, nepotism, <laughs> stay away, and then I'm going to, <laughs> I don't want my daughter to just to be there and keep telling me, okay, it is wrong and it is not right, you have to do this and that. Um, yes, but then probably what 
prompted me and gave me, I think, the passion of pursuing something like this was because I saw the evolution of my daughter when she and how much she grew in the liberal art education. And uh, I think I saw that with my own experience and then I think that I just hope that all the other parents in Vietnam and the children in Vietnam had the same opportunity like my daughter because my daughter was at least she she has the privilege of being here and studying at the one of the very important institution in the US and I want the Vietnamese students if they even if they can't travel to the US they have the same opportunity to do so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, President Thuy, I believe I have something you'll find in, uh, encouraging. So my field is rhetoric, and about, not just that, although <laughs> that could be encouraging too, but yeah. uh, about 20 years ago, uh, along with several other professors, I was part of a grant-funded effort at um, uh, actually conceptualizing Eastern rhetorics and bringing them into the Western wow. tradition in terms of scholarship and, and otherwise. And I've been part of a, an organization for 25 years, the International Society for the History of Rhetoric. But what I will tell you is that what I've seen over and over again is that Western professors, Western scholars, not surprisingly if you think about it, struggle to understand Eastern conceptions of deliberation, debate, yeah. persuasion, and I'm not sure we've ever done the task very well. Yeah. Um, and I, so I believe that what you're doing will be incredibly informative to that uh, some, some number of years into the future, and I think there's a great need for it. Um, and I think Thank more you. than that, that uh, to quote a rhetorician, those who do not learn to talk it out will eventually shoot it out. And so I'm excited about what you're doing because I think it has value far beyond uh, just Fulbright University of Vietnam. So I hope you find that encouraging. I do. Thank you. Thank you. You can double dip if you don't want it. Uh, one of the things I'm curious about with the history between the two countries, obviously it was previously North and South Vietnam, and of course the Vietnam War. What has that done from both the community of the university and from the students? Are they aware of that history and how has it influenced the, your board's interaction with uh, the new university? Yeah, I think wonderful questions because that's exactly what we, we want to offer to our students. History, it, it was taught in Vietnam um, that uh, there is only one story of history. And what we are trying to challenge is that when you talk about history, there are so many layers of history and so many interpretation of history. and how could you provide the students with more than one interpretation of what happened in the past and let them decide that whether history works for them or they like it or they don't like it. And let's talk specifically about the so-called the Vietnam War or American War, depending on um, which size I'm um, calling it. <laughs> we so in one of our history course, um, I think our, the, the history professor show one episode of the Ken Burns Vietnam War um, that actually my daughter worked on that one with, um, with Ken Burns too. And so the last episode is called The Weight of Memory. And so the professor show it and they had some discussion and I was told that the whole class cried after that, um, that course. Of course, the professor was a little bit worried that then they cried because of what? And then maybe I, I'm saying some wrong things that hurt the students. So I, 
I went to the student and asked them that why were you so emotional? Because you were born, you were millennial, you were born in the year 2000. You didn't know much about the war. You learned about it um, at school, but then you learned, I think, one interpretation of the war and what basically make you so touch and move that you cry. And they told me that we never thought that the Americans suffer so much because we thought that only the Vietnamese suffer. And until we realized that, and then that become, I think, it is an awakening moment for many of the students who for 12 years um, at school, they learn only one interpretation of uh, history. And I think that that's exactly what we want for the so-called the liberal arts education. You need to see things from different lands, and especially in history. And now about, um, uh, I think, the board, and then our, um, uh, our students. One thing which is good, and if any of you, I think your chairman have traveled to our country so many times. Do you know that, um, I think, Pew organization did some survey in Vietnam, I think around the time that President Obama visited Vietnam, and 82% of the Vietnamese have a favorable opinion of uh, American, only second to the US. <laughs> so I think that in that kind of environment, um, I think that they don't have a problem of um, interaction, and actually people are embrace American education and then what it has been trying to do, I think very wholeheartedly. Now, of course, I think that we also need to be a little bit selective of, uh, of not trying to embrace everything wholesale, right? Um, but um, yes, they just love it. And um, I don't think that um, there has been any visitors to Vietnam on our campus and feel anything but just like a love and um, warm welcome from the students. Well, thank you so much, President. Yeah, at you. Yeah, she has a question. One more, yes, thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Um, it's such a pleasure to hear everything that you're talking about. Thank and you. I was wondering if you could um, possibly address two areas or yes. just have questions about them. Are you going to be offering um, any fine arts courses um, in your curriculum? Is that part of your humanities? And I ask because yeah. here in the, um, in the US, it's such the creative industry is a huge field in so many different capacities, not only entertainment um, and marketing, but other arenas. Yeah. And then I was wondering, with having such an international um, faculty, if you will be offering or thinking about offering kinds of um, study abroad connections for your faculty and your students. Um, as you may know, we have our um, J term here, January term, and sometimes a June term, where students travel abroad and get to interact with other cultures and the, um, um, people from around the world. So I was just wondering yeah. if those are opportunities your faculty are hoping and your students to cultivate. Yeah. So, uh, yes to both of your questions. Um, fine arts is, uh, is very important in, uh, in our curriculum because when you, when you try to teach engineering and computer science, uh, art is extremely important because without arts, sometimes I think whether it is an app or it is a product, it relaxes um, what we call a soul of the, of the products. So yes to fine arts and, and arts, and it is part of our humanities um, and, uh, and arts. For um, study abroad and, and exchange, yes, we already started our, I think what we call experiential learning center. And um, I think a part, it is now a part of career uh, service center, but when we are bigger, we are going to, to split it. And we plan to have, um, I think our students um, to get into the exchange by the end of sophomore year. Uh, I think that, that that's when probably it is the right time for them to go abroad and doing, um, they can do maximum two terms abroad um, and then they will still um, qualify and then to graduate. 
uh, but then some students may want to do one and some may try to do two. I hope that they have a chance to see Kenosha mm -hmm. and uh, I think the Lake of Michigan so close to <laughs> campus. Um, but then I think it is a part of, uh, of the, the student journey. I think that it will not be complete uh, if they don't have a chance uh, to, to go out and then leave the, the, the kind of, of life that international student experience. Well, thank you so much. We, we celebrate your work. Uh, we are thank fascinated you. with the project, and you know that we will be following it with interest. Yes. And uh, I would say that in the broad sweep of the relations between the two countries, you are continuing to make history, and we're so glad that you're here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.